Thank you. Oh, that's fine, I think. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks to Davor and Emma, Emma for the invite to the conference and to all of you for getting up so early um, after the party last night. I hope you had a nice time celebrating. Um, so as has been said, I'm Sarah Jones. I'm from Giant, which is the network provider across Europe. So we work with NRENs in every country. So Arnes here in Slovenia. And I'm gonna speak about how libraries can work together to protect the scholarly commons, because I think we're at risk of losing control of the data space if we don't work collectively and try and push open infrastructure and services. So what I'll do is I'll begin thinking about the role of libraries and picking up particularly on the Kobiznet example here from Slovenia and from the region. And then I'll draw parallels between that and EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, which is the main area that I work in. And then to close, I'll think about the role of libraries more generally. Um, so my background, I originally worked at the Digital Curation Centre in the UK, and we were working a lot with universities and supporting them in putting their data services in place. And I think libraries play a really key role there within institutions working with researchers. And then also the role of libraries more generally to collaborate with other stakeholders to protect the scholarly commons and to make sure we keep control of the data space. So first off, I, I find this Cobisnet example really inspiring, how you can join up national libraries and information systems across the whole of the region. And I think it's really great that you have um, ISOM here to innovate and to deliver new services and to work collectively with all of the libraries. And Many of the challenges that you faced in setting up the national systems are very familiar with things we're facing in EOS, but also within institutions. So different libraries naturally use different software. Those different systems may not be compatible to support national services. And we're facing those similar challenges that people are implementing very different systems and it's not always easy to interoperate across them. Also, the, the drivers behind the work, the funders supporting the work in the different libraries may be different. And there's not always a kind of joint thinking when people are putting different systems in place. We're not, we don't always have that overall coordination and an eye on the bigger picture of how a researcher, for example, is, is using all of the different tools and trying to think about their workflows and making sure it's interconnected. So quite often there's a lot of um, agreements needed to come towards these national systems. And that's definitely something we're facing within EOS, that there's a lot of um, political consensus and goodwill across the different infrastructures needed to try and get to that collaboration so we can have more joined up infrastructure. I also thought it was really interesting how relevant Cobisnet is to the research data support. So the work you're doing to set up compatible CRIS systems and lobbying ministries and universities to accept that concept of managing the researcher's bibliography in the national library system. I think that's really valuable because the research records then get much greater impact and reuse when they're linked into those broader national systems. And I also really like the way that the Cobisnet model is embodying those principles of openness and connecting in with global systems like the World Cat via OLC, OCLC, you love. So overall, why Cobisnet inspired me when I was looking at your work and preparing for the conference, I really like the fact that it's a nonprofit organization, that openness is central to the philosophy of the work you're doing that you're trying to develop public services with public values. And a lot of that is really core to EOSC too. This is a European collaboration. It's directed by the European Commission, but it brings together a lot of public services in the different countries and member states. And we're really trying to push things so that we can get a greater return on the research investment that's been made. And I think both ISM and the library sector is very collaborative, very trusted services. And that's something we're trying to push as ideals through, through EOSC as well. So a lot of those core values are very similar. So to then explain a little, about, a little bit about EOSC and draw some parallels, the European Open Science Cloud is trying to provide an environment in which um, data and services can be brought together to enable researchers to conduct their work. 
So we're developing what we call a, a web of fair data and services. And we're doing that by federating the different e-infrastructures. So services like Jayant, where I work, or OpenAir, or UDAT, or EGI, which offers compute services, with the different research infrastructures. And there's lots of Esprit research infrastructures, for example, and lots of investments made by different countries in specific thematic um, research infrastructures. And you can see in this diagram, we have this notion of the EOS core. This is the underlying services that allow us to federate and connect those different research infrastructures. And the research infrastructures is where all the high quality valuable data is held. So we're trying to collate all of the data and then offer this exchange layer where there's um, a kind of marketplace of services. So researchers can then access different compute or data analysis and processing services to do their work. And as, as you've seen when you've been drawing together different library systems, there's a lot of challenges in federation. So each e-infrastructure and research infrastructure uses different standards and approaches. So it's not always easy um, to bring them together because they're coming from different starting points. And a lot of the work that we're doing in EOSC is trying to define blueprints or crosswalks. So we're trying to agree effectively an interoperability framework. So we have a core set of standards that people can map to. So in, in my field in MJ and AAI, the single sign-on, we're using the ARC blueprint, for example, and then people can connect their thematic or their community AAIs to that to enable um, log on to all of the EOSC services. Again, looking at the political dimension, the remix and user groups and the missions of different e infrastructures and research infrastructures are also very different. So there's a lot of work needed to articulate the value of being part of EOSC because it's added work for them to, to federate in and to make their data and services available more broadly. So there's a lot to do to try and show the return on investment and to enable them to, to make the case to do that work. One of the biggest investments in EOSC so far is EOSC Future, which is a, a project supported by the European Commission. And EOSC Future is focused on developing that minimal viable EOSC. So the EOSC core, which I explained before in the EOSC exchange layer, and it's doing that by integrating the different data and resources from um, the different cluster projects. So the ESRI projects were joined up in five cluster projects so that we have a, a cluster around different research areas. So environmental sciences, life sciences, social sciences, for example. And they're really acting as a conduit to help the different research infrastructures connect into EOS. And within the EOS Future project, we have the different e-infras and RIs working together to realize that basic vision of the, the minimal viable EOS. But with EOS, there's, there's lots of complexities. There's, it's very much a multi-stakeholder program. Um, we have all the kind of member states and associated countries involved. So there's the political dimension as well as all of the different bodies within each country implementing research support. So all of the research infrastructures, all of the service providers, the universities. So there's lots of different communities that we're trying to bring together. Obviously it's multi-country because it's a European initiative um, and that means it's multilingual, multidiscipline as well because we're covering all the research areas. EOSC is seen as a kind of horizontal um, initiative that will cut across the different common European data spaces that the Commission's now setting up. And all of these different levels add a layer of complexity and it takes an incredible amount of time to try and build consensus and to agree those basic standards and the interoperability framework to be able to move forward. The other thing I wanted to flag is that obviously EOSC is a European platform, but a lot of the engagement still happens locally. So researchers will primarily go to their peers for support or their university data services or the disciplinary research infrastructures they're using. And this means that a lot of the access to EOSC and EOSC services will be facilitated through kind of local connections. 
And I think that makes it really important that we work at a kind of regional and national level. And we've seen some really good models. I think some of the people here have been involved in um, <clears throat> in the NIFOS project, the, which is a kind of Southeast Europe regional project to support EOSC implementation here. And they've developed things like a, a catalog of services and that feeds directly into EOSC. So it enables people to connect at that local level um, rather than trying to have to reinvent their practices and do something different to engage in EOSC. So I think those kind of national hubs or the national engagement is a really important way to drive EOSC. And I mentioned that because we have um, what we call mandated organizations within EOSC Association. The mandated organizations are to try and give a country view um, into EOSC and how we're developing it and how we're implementing EOSC. And the mandated organizations, it's Arnes here in Slovenia, um, they developed a charter about their role and responsibilities, and they saw themselves as having a bi-directional responsibility. So to really be a conduit to coordinate inputs from the country, so the requirements of the research communities, of the different service providers, mm -hmm. to try and build consensus in the country on their needs around open science, and to feed those into EOSC and to aid in the implementation on the national level, but also to have a responsibility within the association to try and serve as a stable backbone of implementing EOSC, because they have been given the kind of appointment by the government to be that representative for the country. So we're working very closely with the mandated organizations to try and roll out EOSCs on a countrywide level. And many of those organizations have been coordinating tripartite events. There was actually one in Slovenia uh, the other week. Um, so Arnes had been key there in trying to bring together all of the different stakeholders to discuss the role of open science and its implementation here um, and the inputs you want to make to EOSC. Another aspect I wanted to pick up on is the role of libraries in research support, because there's lots that libraries are doing at the institutional level to support researchers. Um, and I think researchers are primarily looking for support from the university. You know, it's where they're based, it's where they're doing their core research, it's where they need to store their data to have the relevant services to collaborate with others, either within the institution or outside and also to, to publish and, and share their data. And universities are increasingly providing a suite of research data services to help researchers throughout that life cycle. And often what we see is that libraries are leading in that service development because libraries have a close connection with the research community and they're often responsible for curating the outputs of uh, of science that's going on within the institutions and trying to train the relevant communities. One thing we're seeing an increase of, and I think it's something you're starting to work on here too, um, is the role of data stewards and research software engineers. There's been a growth in universities of support teams to try and help partner with research groups. So staff who have a, a background in a particular research area, but also either have the, the software development expertise or the curation knowledge to be able to help um, manage and coordinate and structure the data so that it can be properly analyzed and also shared and reused by others. So we're seeing much more of a team approach to science. It's bringing together you know, the researchers in the field with relevant support staff and working collectively um, to enable that research to be done and to be done in an open science way. And we're also seeing many more drivers to try and increase the recognition of these data science and data stewardship skills and to build career paths so that these roles are much more sustainable um, so that people aren't damaging their academic career if they transition into one of these kind of data steward roles as well. As I mentioned, institutions often have many different support services in place. Um, and this is just showing an idea of what may be in place across the life cycle. So often there are research information management systems like your Cobisnet system that can be used by institutions as well to manage the research records. Um, but there are often data management planning tools to try and help ensure research is planned in a good way, that it's going to be 
um, well created so that it can be reused. All of the tools researchers need to actually conduct their work. So their lab notebooks, the analysis tools, their kind of storage platforms, and then the tools for the kind of sharing and preservation of data. So repository platforms and digital preservation tools. And universities have an increasing range of, of tools within this kind of suite of services. One of the challenges we see is that different service units within the university are often responsible for different systems. And this is what I meant before when I said about there's not always an eye on the bigger picture and the coordination, because often it's different people purchasing or procuring the different tools. So there's not always interoperability across those systems and good data flows and data exchange across them. We've also seen an increasing tendency to outsource um, some of these services. And I think that that could be potentially problematic in terms of controlling our data and making sure that we retain the rights to everything. If we're using a lot of commercial vendors for our different systems that we're dependent on for supporting research. Um, and that's what, what draws me to that final question. If these institutional systems become closed vendor control systems, how will that affect initiatives like EOS? Because I think what happens within institutions is really critical for both those national services and the broader European collaborations like EOSC. So we need to be working at all levels to try and control the, the data space. I think um, the NREN community, the National Research and Educational Networks could also help in this field. I've been doing a lot of work with different NRENs across Europe. And I think this community is very strong and a good partner to libraries. Um, they're already kind of running a lot of European infrastructure. We run the EduRome um, network. We run a lot of trust and identity services and have shown that we can deliver reliable services at scale. And the members of the national NRENs are the universities, so the people who are grappling with the data management problems. And many NRENs have started to step into this data management space, whether they're offering services like the UDAT suite of services, um, or if they're running repositories, or some of them are also doing procurement frameworks around things like CRIS systems to make it easier for institutions to, to get relevant services, but on good educational terms. And I think the NREN community can act as a very strong lobby for change, for working with commercial vendors when we are, um, and making sure that we get the right kind of terms and conditions for the educational community. The final point I wanted to flag was talking about protecting the, the data space. So we've seen with open access, and, uh, open access publishing, there have been a lot of issues that, you know, we're funded to do the research, but then we're also continuing to pay for that. We're doing peer review for free. We're paying to publish or paying to access the research. So APCs are common, even though there are open repositories and, and new models like Diamond Open Access Publishing. And I think publishers have been very quick to move into the data space to offer support for research data and repositories and developing alternative business models. And I think that's a big risk for us that the same kind of issues we faced with open access publishing could be faced with data as well. We've seen um, large publishers like Elsevier trying to take over the scholarly infrastructure. So buying up lots of tools throughout that whole research life cycle from the kind of first generation of research questions through the data collection, the analysis, and even the um, publishing and evaluation process of research. And I think that's a big risk for us. And this is why the library sector should be working more collectively together to try and push for more open infrastructure and push for more open standards so that we keep control of the, the data space. I think libraries play a critical role because they're central to supporting researchers with their data. And the national libraries also have that responsibility for knowledge creation. And we've seen here in, in your region, very strong collaborations between the national libraries and trying to put in systems like Cobisnet. And I think libraries are also very trusted partners. They're already engaging with the research community. 
they're working a lot with different standards for data exchange and have a lot of networks amongst themselves to to be able to try and work collectively to to try and protect the the data space but it's not libraries alone i think we have to get the different public entities working together to protect the scholarly commons so i flagged already the potential to work with the nren community but also with the different research infrastructures with funders I think we need to work as a community on the standards and the underlying infrastructure we need so that those core platforms we depend on um, to manage research data and to share and to get the most of, of what we've produced um, serve the needs of the sector and are not taken over by commercial interests. And the final point I wanted to flag is just um, this invest in open initiative and the need for open infrastructure. Um, because I think that's really necessary for research to thrive and for us to get the most return on research. So if we can improve um, funding and sustainability in ways that are in line with educational values, we can try and prevent things being co-opted or, co or controlled by commercial interests. And I think there's potential for us to do that at institutional level, but it's also important nationally and at European level as well, because this feeds into things like the EOSC agenda, trying to make sure that we're keeping things open. And, and I think the library community has a big role to, to play in that. So that's, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>